Max Olson, theathletic.com. He has been a, a part of a, a go-to college football writer with us for a long, long time. And he was actually, he bugged, he bugged the room where uh, the, the two commissioners from the Pac-12 and the Big 12 or whatever's left of them were having their powwow last week. Max, thank you. I sent you a text last week. I, I, I sent a text. I said, hey, can you kind of, what have you heard? And you go, I'm working on it. And then you blow out a story, of course. <laughs> And uh, and so let's talk about that. Uh, did, was this just hello? Uh, Bob Bowlesby has been around a while, used to be a part of the Pac-12. Was this kind of just to get to know each other or more than that, in your opinion? Yeah, I think that the feedback I got from people uh, trying to, to, you know, based on the feedback they got from Bowlesby and others about the meeting, first of all, like, these guys just don't really know each other. You know, George Klimkoff is not a guy that's been in this, this whole college athletics industry um, up until, up until, you know, the past couple months. And so, you know, you're not going to jump into some conference saving partnership just on, you know, one day and knowing each other. Right. So it, it, this is, this is a long-term play here. I think on both sides of it uh, where uh, these are two men that I think look at their conference, look at obviously the big 12 is in a much more treacherous position um, when you think about the next four years, but, the Pac-12 is not, you know, they hired him to, to fix the Pac-12. There's, there's obviously lots of problems that uh, that they need to address, and you know, starting with the revenue gap. And so I think these are two guys that are trying to put all the options they possibly have on the table. George Klebkoff has even said he has six options. He hasn't said what those are. But um, I think he's pretty aggressive and, and pretty taking this moment seriously of, hey, this is a, a chance for the Pac-12 to do something bold. And on the Big 12 side, obviously, like, you're going to talk to whoever you can uh, in terms of Power Five leagues. If, if there's some sort of arrangement out there that, that helps you keep this conference together and 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 give your your eight remaining members some financial stability. Max is the Pac-12's first mission, though, to make sure that USC is happy with any of those six options. I, yeah, I think so. I, I think that you know you you learn the lesson from the Big Twelve a little bit of. And obviously, you know, people tried and tried and tried forever to keep Texas and Oklahoma happy, and uh, here's where we got. But, uh, yeah, I think that's a big part of it for uh, the Pac-12. And I, and I think there's like kind of a, a shared benefit there um, of the Big 12 and Pac-12 trying to figure out some logical way to work together is well, what if what if we find an agreement that not only makes us all money, but then also we protect each other because what's stopping – you know, the Big Ten from, from going after the best Pac-12 programs or what's stopping the SEC from saying we're going to build some, you know, 20, 25 team league with the, the, the biggest brands in all of the sport. Like, I, I think you have to uh, you have to play a little offense here or else you're going to be stuck in defense the whole time, you know. Max, you talked to an unnamed Big 12 coach. You asked about recruiting and, and how that's been affected. And uh, that coach said it's killing us right now. It's absolutely no doubt hurting us with how much pain did he say that in his voice uh just just anno annoyance really okay. i think there's, there's just annoyance among among these coaches that even this coach said he didn't really care that oklahoma and texas were leaving so i'm like it didn't really upset him mm -hmm. but it, it is going to be annoying i i think the thing that uh and, and i'm sure you're you know i'm sure baylor fans and your your listeners and all that feel this too is when you sit here and think about okay be patient you know long-term thing uh, you know, 2025, all that. It's just uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to sit here and not have answers on where are we going? What, what conferences want us? You know, is the Big 12 staying together? Is it falling apart? It, it's uncomfortable to, to have to sit back and be patient and trust that that's all going to get worked out. And in the short term, that, you know, certainly uh, that hurts you. You know, I, certainly I, I, I imagine for Baylor, uh, and they've done a great job in this cycle, uh, had a really good summer of recruiting, but if there's a school that wants to poach some Baylor commits, I, I, the messaging is pretty easy. You would say, Hey, you know, don't, don't go there. If, if this thing doesn't shake out right, they're going to be in a group of five league. And, and that for kids and their parents, you know, when you can't give them, you know, really strong answers on here, here's what the future is. then that does put a little doubt in their head. So th I think that recruiting problem is, is going to exist here for the next couple of years until we have a real clear sense of, of what the big 12 is going to look like. I, uh, I don't know who wrote this, but I, I saw a note. Matt Campbell said, listen, we just got to be – we just got to worry about ourselves, which is easier said than done. I'm sure he's also – he keeps his ear to the ground or his eyeballs on what's happening with the landscape, but that uh, no matter what, we're going to be a Power Five. We're going to win, and we're going to be a Power Five program. Is it as easy as that? You know, I think that's, that's 
you know, and, and Chris Kleiman said the same thing that, you know, wherever we end up will be a power five program. I, I think that's what you got to tell your players because this is obviously just hitting at a bad time. You know, at the start of camp here, you're trying to get them locked in. You're trying to make um, some of the most significant improvement with your team here over these next few weeks. And so, you know, in the case of Iowa State, obviously, like, the, you know, everything was fantastic at Iowa State a month ago. And now there's, there's obviously this fear and uncertainty and all that. You have to try and get your team to just lock in and say, hey, we can still be, you know, exactly as good as we want to be this year, um, but we got to block that stuff out. And I know that's something Matt Campbell's been sensitive to, that he feels like this year is going to be a lot tougher for, for, uh, for them than last year was, even, even when you're dealing with COVID last year, because, uh, you know, just, just the expectations and all that stuff. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure that there's, you know, maybe today's players, the juniors and seniors, they're like, yeah, this isn't really going to affect me, but um, you still have to get your team to kind of lock in here and, and kind of block this stuff out. Max, uh, you mentioned uh, Mac Rhodes in the in the article, and that he he said that the three Texas teams have to have to stay together. That is a yeah. relatively new Big Twelve sentiment uh, that those teams have to stay together. Uh, do you think that they are best as a package deal, no matter where they go? Um, I you know I think that it depends on if the Pac twelve actually believes that there is value in playing your flag in Texas. And, and, you know, obviously in all this stuff, value is kind of, it's, it's hard to nail down what exactly that, that means. Does that actually mean, you know, your TV ratings and stuff like that? Is is it the way that the president uh, of those conferences see you in terms of your stature and all that kind of stuff? But um, I I think that this is true of the eight, but I think it's also true of these three, these three, these three schools and, and potentially you put Oklahoma state in that group because of their football success of, we, we have more value together than we do separately. And I, I think that's clearly been the response from these conferences. Um, they're, they're not rushing in to just go snatch up one member of the, the Big 12. And so, um, you know, I, I think it makes sense to, to collaborate, cooperate among those, those three schools because, um, you know, maybe, maybe somebody else has a little better luck finding something and, and can bring you with them. You know, I think that's, uh, you know, we'll see. You know, if the Pac-12 decides we only want to take two schools, then, Look, no one's looking out for Baylor then. You know what I mean? Like, like that, it's every man for himself then, um, if, if that's the case. But right now, I think it makes a lot of sense for them to share information and and you know try to work together to, to put some more options on the table for themselves because that's the job these ads have to do. They have to see what's out there, and they can't just kind of sit here patiently waiting for for Bob Bowlesby to figure out what their fate is. Max, I was just alarmed at looking at the graphic you had about the the draft picks uh, from the last five years. I, okay, first of all, the Big 12 has two less teams than everybody else. But but even then, sure. like they're so far behind in draft picks. What do you chalk that up to ultimately? Because it's been alarming to see year after year we think there's this great crop of players, and then when it comes draft time, everybody else seems to cash in. And outside of two or three you know, big-name guys, the Big 12 just kind of weekly goes by through the draft. It used to be the offenses, right? But but what is it at this point? Do you think that is such a knock in the NFL's eyes towards Big Twelve players? Yeah. So so the the chart you're talking about, I appreciate bringing it up, is you know basically you take the Big Twelve without Texas and Oklahoma over these last five years, and those eight programs are averaging a combined like twelve draft picks a year. And so obviously you know there, there's perception in, in that too. Obviously, like a lot of SEC players get drafted because. You know, these GMs assume that SEC guys are more ready to play right away and all that stuff. And, and the weird thing is you still do see, like, a lot of Big 12 players, you know, go undrafted and, and make it in the league. And, that, and and so clearly, like, there's a perception piece of that that maybe some of these players end up being a little underrated or maybe there's not enough NFL respect for the, the ball they play in the Big 12 in the past or whatever. But, um, yeah, it's... it's it, it doesn't all go back to recruiting because obviously a lot of these programs are taking, you know, like TCU and Baylor are taking three-star guys and turning them into NFL players. Uh, but I think that's kind of that's kind of the challenge here. Is it, it be, among these eight members, I mean, is it going to be harder to bring kind of those four-star, five-star players, you know, keep them home or bring them into your program in, in that future Big 12? And, and I think that stuff is definitely going to correlate to the draft. Do you feel like now that practices have begun – and even though there's some smoldering on occasion, a report here and there that, of course, a lot of it is just throwing stuff against the wall that might stick. I'm not talking about, you know, things that are explaining scenarios. But do you feel like realignment will just simmer now? Or do you feel like there's going to be every once in a while a volcanic eruption? <laughs> I, I, you know, everyone I talk to 
you know, around the Big 12, they, they're still preaching patience. They're, you know, that, look, Texas and Oklahoma are, are not leaving uh, soon, and, and we've just got to deal with this. And, you know, we got that it will simmer down. This stuff will kind of go below the surface again, and, and there will probably be a lot more meetings this fall, you know, among ADs and among uh, commissioners and all that. So, yeah, I, I do think it's possible this stuff will – settle down a little bit it's like there's one of these conferences that tv deal is up next year so uh, i i think there's a little bit of a runway with this but that's that's where, that's where the you know that's where it kind of is going to become challenging is are people willing to sit back and trust that this will play out the right way and that they're going to have either a good destination or the conference will stay together or or do you have some folks who just say no i'm, I'm sick of this i'm sick of uh, the uncertainty and, and not knowing, and, and we need to force the issue and uh, be proactive here. And, and so uh, that that's going to be the hard thing. Is uh, I don't expect everybody to just say, "Yeah, let's talk about this next year." I think there's going to be some schools and, and leaders and stuff trying to force the issue, and we'll see if these conferences are willing to make a move or what kind of timetable the Big Twelve wants to have. If, uh, for example, they want to look into expansion. I don't know, Max. I don't think West Virginia fans can have much more patience. They are they are out on an island, aren't they? The the West Virginia fan base. I mean, they they they're in the Big Twelve, and and they don't really, as you point out in the article, like if that's their only option, that's their only option. But you know, yeah. trying to trying to wish into existence an ACC inviter or whatever, I, I feel for them in a way because ge- geographically, it's never really made sense to the Big Twelve. But this is just throwing their position, you know, for another loop, right? Yeah, and West Virginia has got kind of a fascinating history with this. They've been mm-hmm. in a bunch of conferences over the years, and there have been times in the past when they wanted to get in the ACC and couldn't. You know, when when it was clear the Big East was going to fall apart, um, you know, their their president, he went to the ACC. The ACC said no. He drove to Chicago and asked the Big Ten, and the Big Ten said no. And so, yeah, it's, they, they have this history of going through this. And so certainly their best interest is, uh, you know, if the Big 12 – doesn't stay together. They're, they're geographically, it'd be more ideal to be in the ACC, but um, they're also in, in a position right now where you can't really, you can't really say no to anything. You can't tell Bob Bowlesby, you know, that hey, if you're talking to the Pac-12, leave us out of it because mm-hmm. they, they'd rather do that. Be, you know, have the travel inconvenience of, of a Pac-12, you know, scheduling alliance, for example, than you know, be a member of the AAC where your revenue distribution, you know, is dropping from 38 million to 5 million. You know, you just can't live with that. So yeah, what it, that, that's so important for all these programs is uh, you got to maintain that power five status and get as close as you can to where you're at right now in money. And, and that's, that's going to drive, you know, all this decision making. While we have you, Max, top 25 coaches poll came out. Uh, Bama, I mean, nearly unanimous. Oklahoma at number three got a couple of the other first-place votes. But uh, your thoughts on on the polls? I mean, obviously, it's it's not the end-all, be-all, but it does set the stage for the upcoming season. Man, it, I haven't even had a chance to look at it. Okay. You're really putting me on. Let's see here. Let me pull it up. Okay. Mm. Going to get my live reaction. Hey, there's a team you uh, and I like that's not in it. Let me put it that way. <laughs> there's not in it. They shouldn't be in it. They didn't get a vote. Not, not a one vote. Not a vote. How nope. That? Nope. Hey, FSU got one, yep. so yep. chew on that, guys. <laughs> well, that was a sympathy <laughs> vote. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's very kind of someone to vote for. State. Oh. Um, okay, I think – here's here, my one take I'll give you here. Okay. First of all, I, I think there's probably an argument for Oklahoma being number one. Uh, I can see why other people just default to Alabama because you assume that they're going to you know, be full of NFL studs and, and have the next great quarterback and all that. I think Texas at 19 is too high, and I think TCU, TCU should be in the poll. I, I, I just like I don't I don't know about this Texas team. I'm not I'm not like they're talented, but they're not as talented as people think. And uh, I, you know, we've seen year one for Herman and Strong, you know, end up being those six and six kind of teams. I'm not saying this is going to be that bad, but I can see them being in kind of that six to eight win range, which would not put you in the 25. And I think Chiefs to use probably the one. I think Oklahoma City can be pretty solid, but I think Chiefs to you who is 34. 32nd in yeah, this? I yeah. think you should be a top 25 team. I, I, that's yeah. kind of, we did mm-hmm. mention that. As long as Duggan's consistent, I think they're going to be pretty good. Yeah, and they, they seem yeah. to have uh, uh, some key parts of what they have and what Patterson needs with his defense and all that. Definitely. Um, and and uh, we know that they have won seven of nine against Texas. And so that's one of the teams that's ahead of them. If, and and, and I, I just feel like, yeah, I think in this particular case, that could be flipped. Without many art, not not much argument. I think that could be flipped. So that, yeah, uh, yeah. got to prove it still. That's accurate. And I love the fact that uh, Iowa State getting 
there's it's not like oh let's put them at 11 or no i uh -huh. think they've earned at least now to be a part of the top 10 and now go stay there and and sustain it and see what happens yeah and it's it, it's always fun looking at these there, there's definitely a few teams here that uh you know lsu at 13 usc at 14 miami at 16 there's definitely some interesting teams here in the middle that you're thinking okay maybe they have a chance to really blow up and be a top 10 team but it's I, I, I know that this one's kind of pointless, but it is fun to look at this and start mm -hmm. to consider, yeah, what kind of kind of what are the tiers of teams this year, and and uh, you know who are who are we sleeping on, and how about A and M at six too? Uh, yeah. Definitely a lot of a lot of real expectations there. Uh, don't know who the quarterback's going to be, obviously, but uh, pretty pretty big time expectations there for Jimbo Fisher. Yep, no question, Max. Thank you. Appreciate your time, Max Olson. Uh, theathletic.com, we appreciate his time. We closed it out talking about the discussion of the, the preseason, uh, top 